notification down. Now we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 14, and we have a chance today to be able to grow in the Word as we continue our study through the book of Matthew. It's been an incredible study in many ways. We're being challenged. Matthew chapter 13 is always challenging to the people of God because it tells us about the parables of the kingdom and and what the kingdom is going to be like. And the kingdom is something that we aspire to be a part of. The Apostle Paul said that it's through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom. And so we understand the kingdom and the church are two different things. Well, that's overstating it. The kingdom is a part of the church. But not all the church is the kingdom because the kingdom is pressing into Jesus to release the power of God on the earth and to be able to do some of the things we're going to talk about today. That's really the mindset of kingdom which we are seeing. But so we as God's people um, recognize that there's effort to release the kingdom. There's often pushback, which is what Paul was talking about. By the way, Paul and and his uh, traveling companion were very definitely uh, in the church. But he said we have to go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom. He recognized that he had to keep going after this thing. In, In the midst of everything that he was doing, he was letting the people know that sometimes there's pushback when you're trying to release the power of Jesus and stand for truth in the age in which you live. And that means standing for the kingdom. So we are in uh, Matthew chapter 14. Today we are starting with verse 13. And uh, the uh, title I've given today's message is Stepping into Greater Works. It's important for us to understand that Jesus has called us to step into works that are even greater than the things that he did. Now, some people have a real, real problem with that. Because they say, how can we? Well, we can because Jesus said so. Yeah, you can, you, you can have, if you have problems with that, you have problems with Jesus, not me. Okay. And so this is the scripture. We'll, we'll get to it more toward the end. But I'm telling you the very truth. The one who believes in me will also do the works I am doing. He will also do greater works than these. That's Jesus. He's saying that the people who are walking in his name have the ability to do greater works even than he did. And he goes on to say because he's going to the Father and that's going to have a big impact on the world because he's going to be at the side of the Father moving things on our behalf. But that stepping into greater works is a major part of the story that we have in front of us today. So I want to get right into that so we can talk about that, so we can apply it, and so we can build some faith so that we actually think, you know, maybe I could step into some greater works. Because if you don't believe it, you won't. All things are possible for him who believes. So we are in the book of Matthew, starting with verse 13. We actually ended with the first half of 13 last time just to put it into context what was going on. But today, so that we get ourselves into the context, uh, when Jesus heard about Herod's interest in him, he departed from there in a boat to an uninhabited place away from the public. But when the crowds heard, they followed him on foot from the cities. So we had heard right at the beginning of chapter 14 that Herod was hearing reports about Jesus. And so Herod, with a guilty conscience, he had executed John the Baptist. Matthew does a bit of a flashback to what had happened to John. And we hear how John was executed. And then we jump back to the present in Jesus' day. And when Jesus heard, not that John had been executed, he had already dealt with that, that had already happened previously, but when he heard that Herod was now looking at him, and having Herod look at you with any level of interest was not a benefit, it was a negative, and it would hinder his ability to continue to minister to the crowds, and because of that, he decided to step away. But when he made that strategic move the crowds went with him. They learned that he was leaving, and so they followed him. Now, you say, how could they follow him? Jesus was taking a boat. And, you know, if he's taking a boat, how do they follow? Well, most of the time, you can see what's going on on the Sea of Galilee. 
I mean, you can, you, know, you, can, you can watch. Oh, there they go. Let's go. And so we know from the uh, book of Mark that they went up, well, and from all of these, they went up to the area of Bethsaida, Julius. There's, there's uh, parallel accounts in the other Gospels. And so Bethsaida, Ju- Julius is up there on the right. How do we know it was Bethsaida, Julius, and not Bethsaida, Galilee? Because all, um, all it says is Bethsaida. Uh, because Bethsaida, Galilee is in Herod's territory. Bethsaida, Ju- Julius is not. He was getting away from Herod. So where did he go? He went across the sea, not very far across. He was probably right around Capernaum, which means the crowds could see him the entire way. And they could also just quickly go across the top and get to the place that they were. Remember, if the, if the wind was against the boat, it, it was going to take a while by oar to get there. So the crowds were able to go and get ahead of Jesus to an uninhabited region by the area of Bethsaida, Julius. And Jesus and his disciples thought they were getting away from the crowds, and they were not. When he arrived, he saw many crowds, had compassion on them, and healed their sick. But when evening drew near, his disciples came to him and said, This place is uninhabited, and the mealtime has already passed. Dismiss the crowd so that they might go to the villages and buy food for themselves. Now, they had very, I mean, they were in a a very low population area, but there were some villages, not the type with walls, not the type that would have abundant resource for this crowd of people. But at least people could try to find something on the way. So the crowds beat him across. Jesus had compassion. His, his heart overflowed with compassion, and that resulted in healing. One of the things that I've noted when I am ministering out, especially um, when I'm praying for sick people, there are times a supernatural compassion comes on me. Those of you that have ministered know that. And all of a sudden, you're overflowing with the supernatural compassion. That should increase your faith because you realize the Holy Spirit's involved. He is raising up for an almost, sometimes it's almost inexplicable. You don't even know what's going on. But you feel such compassion. That's a sign. Go for it with gusto, praying for the people. Because the Lord is involved in your prayer time. So pray with a great deal of faith when you have that type of response that is going on on the inside of you. So his compassion overflowed into healing. He did a great deal of ministry. The day kept going on, and we got into the later afternoon as the evening was drawing on. The traditional mealtime had passed, and the disciples now were very concerned for them. And so he said, hey... Um, they said, dismiss the people so that they can start back and get the food they need for the journey. Sounds, we'd do that, right? Wouldn't we? We'd say, hey, it's time for everyone to hit McDonald's. <laughs> you know, Burger King, whatever. You know, we can, we can find places. If we are in an uninhabited place, man, you're going to take a long way to get to Culver's. You better get going. You know, so anyway. But... Um, they came with a, a much more severe concern because <laughs> these people were on feet and there wasn't any fast food places. And uh, so then Jesus responded to them. He said, they have no need to go. You give them something to eat. Uh, we, we find out later there were 5,000 men uh, besides women and children. And so um, they come to Jesus with a very good suggestion of, great administrative point of view. Um, Jesus redirected them, and he uh, said, you feed them. Now, by the way, if the Son of God is telling you, giving you a command, what does it imply? You have the ability, right? If Jesus tells you to do something, this was the issue with, with Moses and Yahweh, which is, you know, the name that is normally all four capital letters. It's the Tetragrammaton, but it, you'd pronounce it Yahweh. And that's just God's personal name. But the, uh, Moses said, you know, he's getting a command from God. You go deliver my people. And Moses says, I can't do this. 
which means he wasn't getting it. And he gave God all sorts of excuses. No, I can't do this, until finally God got mad at him. He said, go. It's always good to volunteer in advance. Lord, I'd be pleased to go. I'd be happy to go. Yes. Even if you're lying. No, okay. Because when he says it, you do it. And I'd like to say I've never whined and complained when I felt the Lord telling me to do something. You know, but it doesn't matter if I whine or complain, I, I'll end up doing it. If I'm aware that the Lord is calling me to do something, I will do it, no matter what, because it doesn't pay to go the other way. Honestly, my call and destiny may be on the line. It may be the doorway through. By the way, the harder the thing is that the Lord is asking you to do, generally speaking, that's the more important that doorway is that you walk through. Because Satan's going to try to do everything he can to make certain that you don't walk through it. So he's going to work in every way that he can to, to, to deal with your emotions and everything else. It simply says, I don't want to do this. But when you know it's God, you go through that door. You have to, because otherwise you, you're going to leave some. <clears throat> do you want to end up standing before the Lord, realizing that you left some critical cards on the table? Okay, and I know that's a gambling term, but it's the point, is that you want to use all the resources, all the opportunities, and you don't want to miss the opportunities. And so Jesus looks at these guys <laughs> and says, you do it. I can't even imagine what they first thought. Now, it's even more interesting than this. This particular story is in all four Gospels. There's very few stories that are in all four Gospels. Even the birth of Jesus isn't in the book of John, right? I mean, it's just four, four Gospels have this story. That's a key. This is important. Pay attention. And the nice thing is, as we search the scriptures, we can look at the other gospels and what they present. And in the book of John, we hear about this story. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, where will we buy bread that these people can eat? But he was asking this to evaluate him, for he knew what he was going to do. Now, Jesus knew what he was going to do, what he himself was going to do. That's, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Wow. He was, some of your translations will say testing him, but tests are given to evaluate. He was evaluating Philip. You know, Philip was one of his first disciples. We're told that in the early part of the book of John. He's the one that got Nathaniel, brought Nathaniel to Jesus, and Jesus said, Ah, ho, oh, an Israelite in, in, there is, in whom there is no gall or, you know, deceit or what, all that stuff. And so Philip has been there from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, from when the time that John said, Look, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Philip was one of the guys who was there at the wedding of Cana. What happened at the wedding of Cana? Oh, water turned to wine. Those big, big water jars. The, the provision ran out. And Jesus made provision out of water. He provided what was needed. And he did that so that the host wouldn't get embarrassed. For the sake of embarrassment. No one would have keeled over on the way home. In fact, with the wine, maybe they did. No one would have died of starvation. No one would have fainted with hunger if the wine had not been provided. And for the sake of his love for the family and his mom, of course, and hearing from the father, because he only ever did what he saw the father doing, he got an okay from the father, he changed the water into wine. Philip was there, he saw that. So what should Philip had known? That if the Son of God, and he may not have had a full understanding of that at that time, but if the Messiah commands you to go ahead and feed the people, 
the resource is there. That was the evaluation process that was going on as Jesus was trying to get through to Philip, one of his first disciples, that there were some works that he could step into. You will do the same works that I have been doing, and even greater. Philip was being challenged to think in terms that he didn't normally think. He was being challenged to live above his personal experience and to live where Jesus lived. Whenever we step into miracles, we're living where Jesus lived. And we can live on this earth and we can live just like normal people. You know, one of the most poignant verses in Psalm 82 when it's talking about the rulers of the peoples, the leaders, and God is confronting them about how they're supposed to govern on his behalf. And he says to them, you will die like mere men, like one of the common rulers, instead of the people that you are supposed to be who will live in authority and might and power and supernatural abundance. And But because all they could think about was serving themselves, he said, you're going to die just like all the other rulers with none of the promises that I could give to you. He's evaluating Philip. Philip, are you going to live in a place that's much higher? Or are you going to live and just kind of be on this earthly pain plane? Are you going to look at him? By, it is pain too. But <clears throat> are you going to live above? Or are you going to stay living down here, scrabbling around in the mud? So Philip had already seen that huge miracle of provision. And so he was being evaluated. And all I can say is the evaluation process is still continuing today. How do you know when you're being evaluated? I can tell you. You've got a shortage of something. You've got a need. You've got something that looks bigger than you are. You're being evaluated. In the same way that Jesus tested or evaluated Philip, you're being evaluated. How are you going to respond to that? You're going to look at the need and go, ah, I can't deal with this. That's, by the way, not kingdom thinking, is it? How'd you feel when you saw the cone on Friday around the southern part of the state of Florida? Okay, I was, I went, this was really bad. I, I, because we've moved, I was delaying my trip to Home Depot to get propane. And so on Friday, Dawn said, we're going to be cooking something outside on the grill tomorrow. And I realized, not without propane, we're not. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, we're in the cone. Which, what that means at Home Depot. Ah. Ah. I'm thinking, well, we may not be cooking out tomorrow. So anyway, I, did, I went early because I knew that that was key. I had to get there before any more reports came out because I, it just, the, the news just drum beats that thing. And Home Be I pull into Home Depot, and I, I, so I, 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 I recognize how most people respond when they see us in the cone. Right? The shelves were emptying at the grocery stores. They were busy. The stores are busy. All sorts of stuff is happening. And I'm just going there to get some propane to cook out. But there is a God. I pulled into Home Depot, and the Amerigas truck was sitting right in front of the store. The angels of heaven. Whoa! You could hear the, cor the choirs going. I got a cart, and I pulled out my propane tanks that had been empty for quite some time. And I walked into the store, and they said, we're not doing it the normal way. The normal way is where you walk in and you deposit your tanks. You have to pull them out of the cart yourself, and you have to lift them up yourself. You need to go in by customer service and pay there and then come out with your receipt, and we'll take care of it all for you. And I went, oh, no, customer service. The line is going to be forever. And I walk in, and there was no one in line. I go to the front. I can hear the angelic choirs <laughs> going even higher. I go up to the front, 
paid for my propane, go in there. And I said, okay, I'm now I'm going to empty the carts. You don't have to. They pull them out. There's, they have a whole setup going. Okay, stop here. Take the gas tanks out of the cart. Over here, we'll fill up. The, we'll replace them. And then out the door. You go out the door. You're done. This was, this was quicker than anything I've ever done at Home Depot. Well, except when you walk in and you go to those nice lockers when you first walk in. You show your phone. Click, door opens. You grab it. Make your escape. But... Um, I saw how many people had propane tanks and how many people were coming. And the only thing that bothered me is I thought, they think I'm here for the storm, right? Okay, now it didn't bother me that much because it was really nice having it set up that way. But um, a lot of people were into a lot of concern and fear. And by the way, when's the time to top off your propane? I'm just going to, this is just me. June 1st. I moved. I had an excuse. But June 1st, that's when you get prepared for the hurricane season. I'm not telling you not to prepare. I think that being good citizens of the state of Florida, our government says, hey, prepare in this way, and you, you prepare in this way. And so you make sure you've got the supplies in that you need unless there's something that got in your way. And, but anyway, so a lot of people got into fear when that cone showed up. Or you can get into faith. And you can say, no, nope, we're going after that thing. And we have seen so much by this time. If you're a member of this congregation for any number of years, and, and by the way, even if you weren't there for all of the stuff, the testimony of this congregation is that God has done some incredible things as we have prayed against storms. And if you haven't read my book, read it. It's about the first storm. That's all. That's all I covered is the first storm. I've got people telling me all the time, write another book. What has happened since then? Because that's 20 years ago. And uh, I, 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 yeah, I will. I will. Um, but in my season, it took me 14 years to write about Irene. Calm down. <laughs> Do you get into fear? And it's okay momentarily to have that flight or fight thing that hits, right? But go toward fight, not flight. Because we've got a God who has called us to live in the kingdom and all of these things are opportunities for us to be able to use the faith that God has given us. And it, I mean, I, I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, our God's able to do this. But if not, so what? We're still not going to do the things you want to do, King Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to do it our way. That's, that's, and that's what we do. We step into it and say, hey, God's going to help us. And if he doesn't, well, oh, well, okay. We tried. We did what we thought was best, but it was always going to be stepping into God, not running away in fear. It's what we do. So the evaluation process still continues. Understand every time you come up against a test, there's an evaluation going on in heaven, and the, the evaluation is Jesus saying, please step into the kingdom, not away from it. Now, he's, he gives you second and third and fourth and fifth chances. He'll continually do that. It's a lot easier when you do it right the first time. Imagine if you have to pass a particular test where it's a short test of shortage. How many times do you want to go through that test? How about you pass it the first time? Then you only go through it once. Because you're going to pass that test. You're going to figure out that God supplies your needs. You will figure that out. But how many times do you have to get to the point of having need before you figure it out? And then suddenly you realize, my goodness, God really provides my need. Nothing is going to shake me from here on in. So anyway, the, Jesus said to them, you give him something to eat. Next verse says, they said to him, we do not have anything here except five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, by the way, when they say five loaves of bread, we know it's barley loaves, told that in another scripture, and we know their loaves were just small little. I, this was a little boy's lunch. Five little loaves and a couple of sardines. These were not big fish. These are small fish. This was basically the lunch of one or two people. That's it. And as I've already said, there were 5,000 people there. So the disciples are saying, you know, we did find some provision, but it's not enough. And so, they, they, and so what did they focus on? They focused on the limited provision. I would imagine if you were there at Cana, you would have looked at the water in those pots. It's water. What's water going to do? It's five small loaves and two fish. What's that going to do? 
In John 6, 7 to 9, Philip responded, 200 denarii would not be enough for them in order that each of them receive a small amount of bread. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, added, Here's a boy who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but what are these for so many? So, by the way, a denarius is, was a day's wage for a working man. So you can do the math, 200 working days. And he said, it's, it's not going to even be enough for basically a, a mouthful for every person here. They were focused on their limited resources instead of on the one who was able to do the miracles that they had seen in their midst. I mean, it gets worse. We're going to get to the, the, uh, a time where they forgot lunch one day, and that was after the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000, and the disciples think they're in trouble because they forgot lunch. It's, you got to break this thing off. I mean, and I'm telling you, off us. I'm not just looking at the disciples. They are who we are. And so they saw miracle of provision after miracle of provision after miracle of provision, and they get down to where there's no lunch, and they go, you know, he's, he's, he's upset because we forgot bread. They kept looking away from him. It was the same when they were on the sea and the, the storm was there. They, they, they forgot who they were with. We can never forget who we're with. Or more appropriately, who's with us. Because he's here. When we trust in him, he takes up residence through his Holy Spirit. The, the miracle, the guy who was, he had been healing this. Uh, he had been healing the sick because of the compassion in him. And now he was going to let people go home in the dark, hungry, stumbling along, not. He was going to meet the need of the people. So in the book of Mark, he actually asks them this question, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found, then they found out. So he had told them, find out what you got. And they went out and they found out what he what they had. So he said to them now, Matthew chapter 14, he said, bring them here to me. He says, I'll take the five loaves. I'll take the two fish. Bring them here to me. He ordered the crowds to settle down on the grass. He received the five loaves and two fish. When he had looked up into heaven, he blessed the food, broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples. It's nice. He took that. He, this is Jesus. He takes the smallest amount of resource. He says, oh yeah, that'll, that'll do fine. Water's in, water in a jar, that'll do fine. We can, we're fine with that. We're, we're in good shape. Um, and then it says he lifted up his eyes to heaven. He's, he's looking to the one who can bless everything. He blessed the food. Jewish traditional meal prayer, blessing the food. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. Okay, that's kind of the line of the prayer. They would usually start a meal with a prayer, end a meal with a prayer. Many households, Christian households, do that. And, uh, but the uh, point was he was looking up at the Father, and he was saying, look what we're about to do. In the same way that he had talked to the Father when he did the miracle of the changing the water into wine. He had said to Mary, it's not yet my time. And then something happened between him and the Father, and the Father says, well, okay, it is your time. Okay, I'll do it. So he he took what they gave him and he blessed it. Now, here's, here's a key for our lives. Pay attention. Um, giving the resource, okay? He said, what do you have? Bring it to me. When we have a need, we bring the resource that we have that is available. But we know it's not enough. Here, here's, here's the thing. I can tell you right now, and I will let you know this because this is not a secret. Um, there are diseases and sicknesses out there that uh, the medical community is very, very concerned about. Okay. They, they're talking about the next pandemic already. You know, they, they're afraid that there's going to be things that uh, antibiotics can't even take care of anymore. And you know, antibiotics have changed the world. Very short period of time. And so if all of a sudden antibiotics becoming worthless because they've been overprescribed or whatever, 
you know, we've got a situation where we could have some major health issues, and, and the most recent pandemic was just a, a dry run. What do you bring? Because yeah, there's a need. There's a shortage. If there's another pandemic, what's the shortage? Well, you know what? I, I take vitamins. I, t I take supplements and all this good stuff that you take because you want to make sure you're getting the best possible food. I actually, I take whatever Don gives me. But <laughs> <laughs> but the, the I mean, and, and so it's kind of like, you know, I expect, Lord, you're going to keep me healthy. I believe that's a promise that you have given me in Scripture and you've given me personally that you're going to give me the strength I need to carry out what I need to do. Now, I know that that's a need that is beyond me. But it doesn't mean I ignore my health. I bring what I have, my five loaves and two fish, to the table. And I say, Lord, this is isn't nearly enough to accomplish what needs to be done. But will you multiply it? And will you make sure that I am covered in every area of my health? We bring the resource that we have. Sometimes when we face a financial need, what we do is we say, I don't have enough. I'm just going to give it all to some, some place in the kingdom because that's, I don't have enough. It's not going to happen. What I got is insignificant for the need. And so I'm going to take, and I'm not telling people to get rid of everything in your bank account and starve your family. Do not do that. But I'm saying there are times when the, you know, it's, it's the Lord saying, hey, so why? Because it, what you have can't meet the need, but there is a God who can take what you have and meet the need. You know, sometimes you, have, I mean, we get into relational need. And some of the most painful things that we experience in our lives are when we're dis a relative is we're separated from a relative. And as far as it's up to you, you can't break through that wall. And all you can do is come before the Lord and say, Lord, all I've got is this little card that says, I wish you well. It's not enough. It has failed repeatedly. But I know you can multiply the impact. And I ask that you do. There's so many different ways that we, as God's people, can, when we're faced with a diagnosis that says, hey, you have this issue, and you say, well, you know, for everything I can do, I'm going to bring what I can forward. I'm going to, you know, do what I can medically, but what I'm going to also do is I'm going to expect God to do something bigger. That's what we do. Jesus took what they had. It wasn't enough. In fact, it was pitiful. I mean, literally, can you imagine? Um, you could have given each person a microscopic bite out of five small, you know, pieces of pita bread and two sardines. And Jesus took it, and he made something happen to it. It made a huge the disciples gave it to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up what they did not need, 12 full baskets of broken pieces. The disciples gave it away. Jesus said, okay, here, start passing it out. Can you imagine being those disciples? Can you imagine being Philip? Okay, what's he going to do with it? You know, he puts it in the basket, raises it up in the air probably. That's why they, I mean, they had baskets. They had their food baskets. These are just little food baskets. Lifts it up, prays for it, brings it down, and starts pouring it into the disciples' baskets so they can distribute it. And they went around pouring out of their baskets, and then, and, and they made sure they, they got all of this food, was multiplying. Can you imagine being one of those disciples and seeing this happening? You need to go like this. Because it was like, wow, this thing is happening. And they're 
passing out the food to everyone. Can you imagine the joy and the celebration? And they get done, and every one of those 5,000 men was full at the end. This is a miracle. (laughs) Especially if they were of a certain age, young. It says they ate until they were satisfied. They could not eat anymore. That's why there were leftovers. You know, when there's leftovers around, you keep noshing until you are really, you are absolutely full, right? And that's why sometimes we'll take the leftovers and, and the extra food and get them as far away from us as we can. I'll say sometimes when I'm at the table, Dawn has made something, and it's just one of those things you can just keep eating, and I say, please take that to the other side of the table. I just don't want to have to go through this struggle right now of not eating more than I need. And so I, these guys were all satisfied. And they, you know, so the disciples gave it away. Everyone was satisfied. And the little, the five loaves and two fish became 12 baskets. You understand that's what was left over, which means the leftovers was, were more than they started with. The leftovers. The leftovers. I start with five loaves, two fish, and I've got 12 baskets of leftovers, and 5,000 men have eaten. You know, it, it's, the Lord blesses what we have. Um, if we, when we bring things to him, just imagine if the leftovers are that profound. See, when there's leftovers, you can give it to more people. When there's leftovers, everything that you get from God, you can go to someone who has the same need. That's, by the way, how it works. You can go to someone who has the same need that you did because you've got faith and you can pray for them and you can see that miracle unleashed in their life. Your testimony, they overcame by the, the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and the fact that they did not fear death so much that they were not willing to lay their lives down. Those three things together... Why are all three important? Because, number one, the blood of the Lamb gets you saved. Number two, he starts to meet you and miracles and signs and wonders happen. And you're able to share that in your testimony, but you're not going to share it in your testimony if you're afraid. You know, we focus on martyrdom. They did not love their lives so much that they shrank from death. The issue for us is often we just don't want embarrassment. And if we'll get to the place where we can die to self and share our testimonies, we'll see miracles multiplied everywhere. Now, I know I'm, I'm speaking to the choir again because so many of you do this already. But I, I, I want to be able to say we've got to challenge ourselves to keep pushing forward in this particular area because of the fact that God wants us to see his miracles. And here's, here we go. About 5,000 men ate without counting women and children. This is the size of this miracle. We call it the feeding of the 5,000. All they counted was the men, because that was easier, because the kids would never have stopped moving. So there were always more women than children. There just was. The men they had to be out doing whatever they were doing. And the, 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 um, so, and the men that were available, they'd come with their families, and so their families would come and, and be with them. But then a lot of women came who were with their children, and the assumption is that we were at about 20,000 people. You can assume between fifteen and 20,000 people just got fed by Jesus with five loaves and two fish. And, and again, he starts with Philip. Hey, Philip, what do you think? I think they're hungry. Yeah, you feed them. I'm telling you, we're going to run into hungry people all around us. And it's going to be more and more. And I'm not necessarily talking about physical hunger, although that could be. But whatever they're hungry for, if we've seen God do that in our lives or the lives of others, we've got the ability to feed them. And we got to step forward in faith because that's how you enter the kingdom. 
You die to your own recalcitrance, to your own, I just don't want to step forward, and you do what you need to do so that you give God an opportunity. Worst thing that happens is you pray for someone, and they say, thank you, that was really nice. Because they wouldn't have allowed you to pray if they weren't open to it. I mean, they can say no, but that's no skin off your nose. Worst thing that can happen is they can look at you and say, that was really nice. And the best thing that can happen is that God meets the need right there and does an amazing miracle. I can't tell you how many times we hear testimonies from people saying, you know, you prayed for me and then it changed. You prayed for me and then it changed. You prayed for me and then it changed. And I'm not even telling you what it was that changed because there's, it's in all sorts of different circumstances, different areas, different applications. And you've encountered that. One of the reasons we're doing testimonies on Sunday morning the way that we do is so you understand it's not just leadership that does this. It's all of us. And you see things changing in people's lives. And that's when you're passing the evaluation. When you're being evaluated by God and he's in heaven saying, yay! Okay, I told you we'd get back to this particular verse. I'm telling you the very truth, Jesus said. The one who believes in me will also do the works I am doing. He will also do greater than these. Why? He's, we're going to do greater works than Jesus. Getting ready to do the greater works. Are we, you know, we're being evaluated by God to be able to step into his works and then greater works. Why are they going to be greater works? Because I am going to the Father. Then whatever you ask in my name, this I will do in order that my Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, I, I want you to look at that. Because if you say, I ask a lot of things in Jesus' name and it doesn't happen. Well, you have to understand what it means to ask in Jesus' name. What it means to ask in Jesus' name is there's a congruence there. There's simply saying, I'm walking as a child of God. And in uh, 1 John 3, 2, dear ones, if our hearts do not convict us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we may ask, we receive from him because we keep his commands and do the things that are pleasing to him. James says, you, have, you don't have because you don't ask and, and you don't have because you are asking selfishly. When it, to ask in Jesus' name is in line with his will. Your kingdom come, your will be done, and you better know enough about God to know he wants good things to happen when you pray. Now, if you are praying and you are saying, I'm doing this because I believe it is your will, God, to change this circumstance, and you can make the case for it, your faith builds. And you're able to go after it. And then your faith just keeps building because you see God doing it again and again. Philip didn't do such a great job here being, uh, passing the test. Next week, we're going to see someone who almost passes the test with flying colors. Okay, almost. It's obvious that Peter saw what happened here and said, I am going to walk in what he walks in. Literally. But in the meantime, every, every shortage, every problem, everything you're coming up against today, tomorrow, the rest of this week, realize that there's an evaluation going on every single time. And every one of those things is a doorway that you can walk through into the kingdom of heaven and see God's purposes released on this earth. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study this very familiar story. This story which is about the multiplying of bread, but it's about so much more than that. It's about evaluating your disciples. 
And I ask, Lord, that you would use this story to empower us so that we are able to pass the tests so we don't have to retake them. We can walk through the doors into kingdom power and then be able to release that life to other people. You are so good to us. And I ask that you would help us respond to it. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, thank you. And anything else going on over here? Nope, okay, streamers. Nice to have you with us today. Go out and do something miraculous today. Just have fun. That's what God wants us to do. We get filled with joy when we do this. Your joy will be complete, Jesus said to us when we step into this stuff. So next week, Friday, 7.30, or this week, Friday, 7.30, we meet. Also on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. See you then.